everybody. My name is Lara Baxley, and I am the president of the Academic Senate here at Cuesta College. And I am very excited today to introduce uh, Megan Lorraine Devins, talking about iconography at King Table Con. And before I introduce Megan, I would like to thank the Associated Students of Cuesta College for providing the funds for the food that's over here. If you didn't get any food, go ahead and grab. <laughs> If you didn't get any food, go ahead and grab some on your way out. All right, so now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Megan. So uh, Megan Lorraine Devon is art history lead faculty in the fine arts division here at Cuesta, where she teaches art history, art appreciation, and museum studies. She is a PhD candidate in the Department of Art History at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she also earned a master's degree in Latin American studies and a BA in art history and Italian. Her research primarily focuses on contemporary performance and land art in Mexico. Other research interests include pre-Columbian art, which she will discuss today, global indigenous art, feminist art, street art, internet, new media, and activist art. She is currently writing her doctoral dissertation titled Body Traces, Contemporary Art Against Violence in Mexico which considers art actions that respond to the ubiquitous violence in this region. To date, her dissertation research has benefited from support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and UC Mexis, University of California Institute for Mexico and the United States. She has lived in Italy, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Peru. When she is not working, she is traveling <coughs> Though she tells me that the two are not mutually exclusive. So, without further ado, here's Megan. Thank you. Hello, thank you. It's interesting to listen to somebody talk about me with the words that I wrote for her to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was my joke. I'm done. Nothing else will be funny. Um, all right. <laughs> So today I'm going to be talking about iconography at Teotihuacan, as I'm sure you have surmised um, by looking at the screen here. And I'm going to talk about these words, iconography and Teotihuacan, in a minute. But before I do that, I just want to plug a class, a new class that we have in fine arts, Art 207, a Mexican art history class in which we actually talk about Teotihuacan, among the many other indigenous civilizations of Mesoamerica. Um, and there's also a unit on the Andean region as well. So it's a new class that I'm teaching right now, um, and it will be offered in the fall. Um, I even looked up the times, okay? So you can <laughs> sign up Tuesday, Thursday, uh, 1130. Um, okay, so that's my plug. So that was my one joke, and um, that was um, my plug. So now let's get serious. I'm going to make it a little bit darker because I like it dark. That's the only reason. Also, I think you can see the images a little bit better. Okay, hopefully that's not too dark. All right, so uh, let's talk about... Um, some of these terms, iconography um, and Teotihuacan. And I'm going to start with a really basic question. What do art historians do? So you heard that I'm an art historian. Um, when I ask my dad, what do you think an art historian does? He says, I don't know. Um, does anybody have an idea? What does an art historian do? Come on, don't be shy. Yeah. And then we can see how we've evolved. Wonderful, wonderful, yes. Um, perfect answer, right? And this really is what art historians do. Um, we can tell the difference between all of the David statues. Um, this is my second uh, joke. Um, I also cannot do math. Just ask the Art History Club um, when we spent an hour trying to do basic, simple math, and a nursing student walked in and said 37. Um, after we just wasted an hour. I can't do math, but I can tell you that this is Donatello's Bronze David. 
<laughs> okay, so we're not going to actually be talking about um, Renaissance art today. Um, but yes, this is what art historians do. We study um, art objects, right? Sculpture, painting, architecture. Um, in my case, I also study contemporary art, so I look at performance art, installation. Um, but in this case, we're talking about really ancient art today. So we look at art objects, we study them, um, and then we write about them. Um, and we also talk about the cultural conditions that give rise to these art objects. Um, there are um, all of these, oh, there's another David. This is Michelangelo's David, FYI. Um, this, is, this is also a joke. I told you there was only one joke. There's lots of jokes. Um, <laughs> so here um, we're looking at Michelangelo's David. Um, but anyway, we study all aspects of culture. We study history. We study mythology. Um, we study spiritual beliefs, religious practices. Um, of course, economic and political systems. And we try to understand um, all of these aspects of culture. We try to understand why people made things. Um, and if we can understand the object, in this case, today, when we're talking about an ancient site um, where we don't have written documentation from the time, we can also try to figure things out about the culture based on the art objects. Right? Um, OK. And of course, there are different, oh, this is Bernini's, David. Okay. All of my art history students know this, right? Yes. <laughs> Good. Good answer? <laughs> that is the correct answer, yes. <laughs> um, so we use different methodologies when we're doing art history. So we might look at the artist's biography. Um, we might think about psychoanalysis. So if we're looking at Van Gogh's painting, we might talk about how mental illness might have played into um, what, what he chose to paint and how he painted it. Um, a formalist approach will look at the formal elements of art, the principles of design, things like line and color, um, how the artist uses these to express things. Um, so in Bernini's David, which we're looking at here, um, my students will know that we talk about all of the diagonal lines of David's body um, that create a sense of movement and motion in this Baroque piece. And of course, um, this drama and movement is typical of the Baroque. Um, we also will look at iconographic analysis. Um, and that's really um, what we're going to talk about today. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we also uh, look at social art history. At UCLA, I was trained by social art historians. Um, most of um, the professors at UCLA, well, I don't know, maybe not anymore, but they were all Marxists um, in the 70s. And so everything was always about power and labor and stuff like this. And so I think about those things a lot. And I was trained by social art historians um, to think about um, how power is wielded and how that relates to art. Um, but as I mentioned today, we're going to talk about this term, iconography. So you saw this on the poster. Um, iconography um, really basically means um, we're going to be looking at the, what's depicted, the subject matter of the art. So of course, um, it comes from Greek icon and graphe, so image and write. So it's the study and interpretation of the symbolic language of images. Um, and then we'll also look at iconology. And to me, this is um, even more interesting than iconography, although in the field of pre-Columbian art history, so pre-Columbian means before the arrival of the Spaniards to the Americas, of course, um, iconography is a really big topic because a lot of the things that we have, um, we don't know that much about them because we don't have anything written at the time that they were made. We have things written by the Spaniards, um, but you have to take that with a grain of salt because probably they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> or at least it's filtered through a European perspective. Um, and anyway, the Spaniards were writing down things about cultures that were very ancient already to the Spaniards, right? Um, so we don't have a lot of written documentation, which means uh, that iconography is debatable. Like, oh, this is the serpent god. Oh, no, it's a fire god. These are the kinds of arguments that art historians have. Um, and then we talk about iconology. What does the iconography mean? So 
Okay, if we can agree that it's a feathered serpent god, what does it mean to depict the feathered serpent god on the temple? What does it mean at that time, at that place, at that moment in history? And so we really think of the art object as a document of that moment in history. Yeah? Okay. Um, so that's one crazy word. Should we talk about the next crazy word here? Okay, you got iconography. Um, let's talk about Teotihuacan, shall we? So this name, well, actually, we don't know what Teotihuacan was called. This name is a name that the Aztec gave the place. This is not an Aztec site. This place is ancient to the Aztec. It, people lived at Teotihuacan almost a thousand years before the Aztec came around. Um, so we don't know what the Teotihuacanos, and this is a, a name that we made up for the people who lived at Teotihuacan, we don't know what they called this place. So we just call it what the Aztec called it, Teotihuacan. Um, and I'm going to start um, with this image where I am dressed appropriately to climb a pyramid, as you can see. Um, <laughs> All of my pictures I'm dressed very appropriately. Don't worry, there's more. Um, every time I go there, I wear a mini skirt. Um, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. They look like this. <laughs> yeah, I learned my lesson. No, I would wear boots um, after the first time. I started wearing boots. Um, but I still wouldn't put pants on, I don't know. Um, okay, so I start with this image because this is the first time that I went to Teotihuacan. Um, I was just on a family trip um, in Mexico and we had decided to go stop in Mexico City um, and drive down to the beach. And oh, while we're here, let's go check out these pyramids. I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know where I was going. Um, and I went to this site and I had a transformative experience. And of course it was on top of a pyramid. Of course it was. Okay? Um, so I climbed up to the top of this pyramid and I was just amazed and in awe of this site. Um, and I was also really frustrated that I, um, I had already graduated from college and I didn't know anything about Mexico. I'm a product of the California school system and I didn't know anything about Mexico. And this is when I decided to go to grad school and study Mexican art. So I start here um, with this moment. So let's talk about Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan, um, as you can see on this map, um, is about 30 miles northeast of uh, Mexico City. So you can see it here. Um, and this term, again, an Aztec term, a Nahuatl term um, for this place means the place where the gods were born. So according to the Spaniards, and again, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. According to the Spaniards, um, the, the Aztec thought that the, the gods were born here at Teotihuacan. Um, it was an ancient site again already by the time the Aztec were in power. And of course, we know the Aztec, they're the ones who were in charge when the Spaniards arrived. Yes, we already know that. Okay. Um, so again, um, north here, um, of Mexico City, and if you go to Mexico City, it's really easy, day trip, you just take the bus that says Pyramides on it, just don't fall asleep, okay? Because if you do, you'll wake up in some village and it will not be Teotihuacan, <laughs> okay? Just telling you, that only happened once. Okay, so, um, what is the landscape like around Mexico City? Um, of course, this is a romanticized, idealized view of um, Mexico. This is a landscape painting by Jose Maria Velasco depicting the valley of Mexico. Um, when I was in grad school and I was studying Mexican art and sometimes I would go down um, to do some research and I would come back and people would say, why aren't you tan? Um, and I said, well, I was in Mexico City and they thought uh, Mexico City was like Cabo or something. Um, <laughs> it's actually Mexico City, I mean, it's pretty warm pretty warm, but it's actually this really high valley um, that's surrounded, um, that you can see depicted here um, in this painting, um, surrounded by volcanic mountains. Um, and if you pay attention to the internet, you know that El Popo is exploding, shooting out um, fumes and whatnot, and ash right now, 
right now. Um, so anyway, um, it's this sort of rocky landscape um, can be very dry when there's no rain. It can be really green when there's rain um, and surrounded by this um, volcanic mountain chain. So this is what um, sort of it would have looked like um, in the collective imagination um, before the Spaniards arrived. So this is a fantasy, right, um, of what it would have looked like, but pretty close um, in terms of the sort of ruggedness of the environment. Um, so this is what it looks like um, when you go there. Um, it, the city itself, Teotihuacan, the place where the gods were born, um, rose in the first century BCE and had pretty much collapsed by 650 um, common era. Um, so the end of the classic period in um, Mesoamerican um, sort of archaeological timeline. Um, the end, sort of the end of Teotihuacan denotes the beginning of the post-classic period. Um, and again, as I've said a million times, it was already really old to the Aztec. There's some evidence, again, I don't know if you want to believe the Spaniards or not, but if you do, um, they say that Moctezuma II um, made pilgrimages to Teotihuacan in the 16th century. Um, it was, of course, a ceremonial center, um, but something that was really unique about Teotihuacan at the time and why I think it's really cool and interesting is that it was a city in the true sense of the word. It was a cosmopolitan metropolis. There were 125,000 people living there at its height, which even here is a big city, right? A um, lot bigger than San Luis Obispo. It was a huge city, um, and there's evidence that people had come from different parts of what is now Mexico and Mesoamerica, um, different parts of the known world to live here. So people um, migrated and moved here. Um, there's evidence that there were ethnic barrios. So there's like the Zapotec barrio where people from Oaxaca are living. They're making their traditional arts. Um, they're probably worshiping their own gods, speaking their own languages. Um, so, and there are Maya. We find at Maya sites, actually Maya bragging that they like have been to Teotihuacan or that like somebody got married to somebody from Teotihuacan. Like it was a sign of being cool. Um, really, really big city. And at that time, most of the other sites um, in the classic period and before this weren't really cities. They were ceremonial centers. So there were pyramids um, and there were all of these um, permanent structures, but most of them were used for ritual purposes. At Teotihuacan, we have something that we really don't see anywhere else, and that is we have apartment compounds for regular, everyday people. Um, Multi-family living units, and some of them, the nicer ones, have really amazing murals, which unfortunately we don't get to talk about today. But if you want to see some, and you don't want to go to Mexico City, but you should, but if you don't want to, you could go to San Francisco, and you could go to the De Young Museum, and they have some um, fragments from uh, murals at Teotihuacan, which have a crazy story because like some guy had them in his garage and then he died and then he gave them to the city of San Francisco and Mexico was like, oh, excuse me, hey, can you give those back to us? And um, San Francisco said, uh, sorry, <laughs> those belong to the people of the city of San Francisco. Um, and so there was this big legal battle um, between Mexico and the city of San Francisco. And in the end, they agreed to give half of them back to Mexico and keep half of them at the de Young Museum in San Francisco. So now you can go there and you can see them. Um, and of course, they were, you know, arrived to this man through the black market, right? So um, anyway, that's why Mexico wanted them back. Well, yeah, because you can't just do that. <laughs> or maybe you could at the time, but... Technically, um, if you discover something had arrived through the black market after the 1970s, um, you had to give it back to Mexico. So anyway, this really interesting city with these apartment compounds, um, with ethnic barrios, um, a really massive city uh, for the time. Um, I think I've read that it's like it was the sixth largest city in the, in the world at the time. So a really big city. Um, just to... Remind you, here's our handy-dandy Mesoamerican timeline. Uh, so 
You might have heard of the Olmec people, the sort of mother civilization of Mesoamerica, and certainly you've heard of the Maya and the Aztec, and so Teotihuacan is up here. So you can see that it really rose and fell long before um, the Aztec Empire ever really solidified. Also, this map is weird because it looks like Maya people don't live anymore, and Zap Zapotec and Mixtec people don't live anymore, and they do. They totally do. So I don't know why it says. I guess we're talking about sort of in terms of the power of the civilization sort of declines in these moments. Um, OK, so um, it falls about 650. Um, and then um, the Aztec, again, perhaps made pilgrimages to there. Um, when the Spaniards arrive, they sort of leave it, and they kind of don't care about it. It's in the countryside. Um, and it gets sort of overgrown. So here we're looking at um, a, a romanticized, idealized vision of it, but we're looking at a 19th century oil painting um, that shows us um, the Pyramid of the Sun, um, and right here, the um, Calle de los Muertos, the Avenue of the Dead, so the Spaniards called it. And you can see that around here, it's really sort of overgrown in farmland. It remained like this for hundreds of years until the 20th century when excavations began. So when you go today, if you go in the summer or at the end of the summer, this is what it looks like at the end of the rainy season. So now we are standing on top of the Pyramid of the Moon, and we are looking down this avenue, uh, the Avenue of the Dead, the Calle de los Muertos, um, and we're looking at the Pyramid of the Sun, this really large pyramid here, and then down in the south of the city, so we're standing in the north looking south, um, down in the south of the city is the Temple of the Plumed Serpent, which we're going to look at closer today um, very briefly, but I kind of wanted to give you an overview of the city. The city itself is about eight square miles. Um, it's not totally excavated. There are ongoing excavations. Um, I thought that maybe I wanted to be an um, archaeologist, but I don't have the patience for um, dusting things, like, really <laughs> slowly, you know? So when I was, like, a little kid, my, um, my parents went on a trip to Europe, and my mom went to the British Museum, and she came back where she got me this present, and it was, like, like a mini archaeologist kit, and you have to, like, scrape away to get all the broken pieces of the Greek vase, and I just threw it on the ground and smashed it into a million pieces, and I was like, I can't do this. I'll just be an art historian instead. <laughs> um, that's how it happened. <laughs> um, so anyway, archaeologists are always digging up new things, um, and we're waiting for them to finish with that dirty work so we can come over and look at the objects that they've dug up. Um, actually, their grad students do it, so it doesn't matter. I could have been an arche archaeologist. Um, OK, so we're looking at um, this massive pyramid, and we see these other smaller pyramids and platforms around. There are also over here some of the apartment compounds. And you can see that there's some development around here. Actually, when you go on top of the Pyramid of the Sun, you could see a Walmart in the distance. For reals, I swear. Um, also, there are some structures that if you go out um, into the countryside that are still there and they're just sitting there waiting to be excavated. Um, all right, so I told you all of these things. Um, we're looking at the site plan. So we were standing on top of the Pyramid of the Moon. We saw the Pyramid of the Sun here. Um, you can see that it's really laid out. Um, it's a planned city. Um, it, it was no accident the way that it was laid out. Um, in fact, uh, the pyramid that we'll look at today, um, they actually rerouted a river so they could build it there. Um, so they knew what they were doing, and they had their reasons, and maybe we, don't, we won't ever really know, but they really were city planners in the truest um, sense. And this grid that it's laid out on is roughly north and south. Um, if you go out into the countryside, the structures that are yet to be fully excavated are also laid out on that grid still. Um, OK. Here we're looking at the Pyramid of the Sun. Um, you can see it's massive. It's one of the largest man-made structures in this part of Mesoamerica. Huge, massive pyramid. 
Um, and you can climb up to the top of it um, today. And you can see a bunch of people climbing up it here. Um, here, see, look, uh, another, this is me, dressed appropriately again, um, also wearing a mini skirt. Um, and you can see in the background um, the pyramid of the moon. I show you this um, because I want to show you how appropriately I always dress, but I also want you to see how steep it is, right? Really, really steep. Um, most people, regular people, all of these 125,000 people that live in the city were not climbing up this pyramid, right? It was reserved for a small number of elite. On the top of it, it's no longer there, but there would have been a small temple where a priest would have gone, and it, you go up there to talk to the gods. And then you come back down, and you stand on these platforms, and you tell everybody, I talk to the gods. I know what to do. These are the things that we need to do to keep the gods happy, to appease the gods. Um, so um, here you can see that they have this really nice rope thingy that you can hold on to, this like rubber rope that you can hold on to when you're afraid, because um, it's kind of scary. It's really high. Um, so uh, this is an artist's rendering of what it would have looked like. And I always love these things, because I think that it helps to give us an idea of what it might have looked like. Um, everything that we look at now, it looks like it's sort of um, stone and just rocks and some, sometimes it looks kind of like rubble, but it, everything would have been stuccoed over and then painted really um, right, vibrantly with these reds um, and greens, um, with these natural pigments. Um, there would have been small temples on the top of each of the pyramid platforms. Um, it would have been a really amazing sight to see. And also, this is somebody's job. So if you really like art, um, you can get a job making these images, right? Um, there are lots of jobs that art, artists can do. Um, the most recent discovery uh, on top of the Pyramid of the Sun is this giant um, stone sculpture, which um, I, I don't know why it's on its side. Um, but this is how it was published in the Mexican newspaper. So that's why I present it to you this way. Um, I don't know why they didn't stand it up. But anyway, I guess it can't stand up on its own. Um, this is what they found when they dug at the top um, of this pyramid way up here. They're digging down into the top of it. Um, and they find this really massive um, piece of stone that if you flip it on its side and you look at it, you go, hey, that kind of looks like the Aztec deity way, way tail to the old fire god. Um, so this is where um, art historians start doing their work. They look at these objects and they go, well, this looks like something that we've seen during the Aztec period. So again, we're not sure um, if this is the same deity, but he looks similar. Um, he's usually represented as an older gentleman um, sitting cross-legged, um, and then he wears this big um, sort of hat crown thing on his head and his ear spools. Um, what we're looking at here is a ceramic sculpture um, from the Aztec period. Uh, people look at this and go, oh, you know what? Um, maybe this is a depiction of the old fire god. Yeah, for, from holding up this really heavy thing on their head, right? Um, so we see this deity depicted um, in some Aztec art, although we don't have a ton of Aztec art because guess what the Spaniards did when they arrived? They burned the idols. They smashed everything. They broke everything. If anything was gold, they melted it, melt it down, right? OK. Um, so we don't have too much, um, but we do have some objects left to look at. Um, and we do have some codices or ancient books to look at. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to focus on that, because I want to get us down to the Pyramid of the Plumed Serpent. Um, here we're looking at, um, we're standing on top of the Pyramid of the Sun looking at the pyramid of the moon. And I show you this because I want to show you the difference, um, what it looks like in the dry season and what it looks like in the rainy season. Oh, finally you dress. I put some pants on. This is what happens as you get older. You realize you should wear pants. Um, so here um, you can see the difference, right? You can see um, how dry it can be um, during periods um, when there's no rain. And of course, you can see that it can be very lush. Um, right behind the pyramid of the moon, you have this mountain, this massive uh, mountain, Cerro Gordo. And a lot of scholars like to talk about this idea that um, 
perhaps um, this urge to build pyramids. And of course, you can look at things like the ziggurat of Ur in Mesopotamia. Um, you can look at other structures that um, humans build um, temples um, up towards the sky, um, perhaps so that we can get closer to the gods, because we think they live in the sky, I suppose. Um, and a lot of scholars talk about this idea of the pyramid being um, a man-made mountain. Um, certainly, this idea pans out when you look at places like Teotihuacan and you realize how important water is at these sites, right? Um, if you have water, um, you can control the food source. And if you can control the food source, you can control the people, right? Um, so perhaps um, these pyramids are sort of speaking to um, the role of mountains in um, this cycle of bringing water to the site. Um, OK, so finally, so now we're going um, south, and we're going down here to the Ciudadela, um, the citadel. So this part um, of the city is the part down in the south that was built later and where they rerouted this river to build um, this pyramid. It's a walled off precinct, right? This is what Ciudadela means, citadel, this sort of fortified um, part of the city. Um, here's an aerial view, so you can see um, all of this is raised and fortified. There are smaller temples around it, and then there's the larger um, pyramid that we're going to look at closely today. Here's an artist's rendering of what it would have looked like. You can see, again, that everything would have been stuccoed over. Everything would have been um, painted um, very elaborately, very sort of brilliantly. Um, so you get into um, this, this citadel. And I have this picture here just so you can see, like, here are some people. So you can see how massive everything is. Everything is really huge here. Um, and this is what you see. This is the Temple of the Plumed Serpent. Finally, um, this is what we're going to talk about and what we're going to look at closely today now that you have the background. So um, this is built later. Um, of course, you can see that it's very damaged. Um, but you can see um, that there is this facade here. So there are elements of the facade that um, we can still look at today. Originally, again, would have been um, stuccoed over and painted. There would have been a small temple on the top. You can see there's a central staircase. There are these serpent heads that line um, the central staircase. Um, and then there are these faces here on the facade, which we'll look at closely in a minute, um, that go around the entire pyramid, right, on each level here. Um, and then there's this sort of platform that was built in front of it, perhaps by a later ruler. Um, we see this at other sites, definitely in the Aztec period, that the Aztec Templo Mayor has seven stages of construction. So um, each new ruler goes, oh. Um, you have a big temple, I'm going to build my temple bigger than yours, right? Um, so perhaps this was something that was happening at Teotihuacan, um, but this um, was sort of abandoned. But we do see that it's, when you walk into it, you can't even see this pyramid because it's blocked by this other one in front of it. So let's look closely at it. What do you see on this facade? Yeah? Oh, come on. You know the answers. <laughs> maybe, maybe Tlaloc and Quetzalcoatl. Maybe. Um, so let's look at it closely. Um, we see certainly, can you see this? What's that? Oh, I like that somebody thought it was water. Um, so maybe water, maybe a snake, maybe both things at the same time. That's my favorite. Um, can you see these little things here? What do these look like? Shells. Shells. OK, definitely referencing water. Um, some people think this looks like water. Some people see that this is sort of an undulating serpent. You can see the head here. You can see it down here as well. Um, and then you can see um, that you have something that looks like this um, serpent down here, also repeated right here. Um, and then you have these other heads. Right? Um, and this is what we're going to look at closely. And we're going to sort of try to figure out um, who these figures are. 
Oh, here's a better image. Um, so this is what it looks like when you go today to the site. You can see that there are traces of paint on here. So, um, so it would have been really brightly painted. Um, and when you go to Mexico City, you have to go to the Museum of Anthropology, one of the best museums in the world. And you can go see this replica of the facade of this um, pyramid. Um, and you can see in the replica that they've painted everything so that it looks how it would have looked right um, at the time. So you can see that sort of undulating serpent figure that m is maybe kind of um, feathered, perhaps referencing water. Um, and we can see these two faces, right? So this one that, for me, honestly, the first time I saw it, everybody told me it was a snake, but it looked like a feline to me, um, perhaps a sort of composite creature. And then this um, face here that we'll look at closer. So here you see um, this face that's got this, this kind of like, I don't know, sunglasses or goggles on. Um, these are probably ear spools. Um, and then if you look at it from the side, you can see that it has this kind of like curly cue mustache thingy. And then hanging down here, a little bit hard to make out, there are some fangs. Um, and then some people talk about this texture. Um, so perhaps um, maybe referencing like scales, something like that. Um, so this is um, one of the faces, and then this is the other one um, that everybody says looks like a serpent. Um, sometimes to me it looks like um, a kind of feline face here. Um, but we do have um, this kind of, I don't know, feline serpent face, perhaps looks like it's feathered or scaly. Um, and then he wears like this really cool necklace thing um, that reminds me of like a really Baroque, like those white collars, like in a Rembrandt painting. Right? Um, so anyway, that's what this looks like to me. But perhaps flower petals or perhaps feathers. Um, and a lot of people see these and say, well, I know what's depicted here. Um, let me tell you. Oh, here's a close up so you can see um, that you've got these kind of like fangs. And of course, everything would have been painted. Um, so, so a lot of different scholars um, have different ideas about um, what's depicted here. Um, there's some scholars say that um, they would have inserted obsidian into the eyes, so into the sockets of the eyes on these creatures, and that they would have um, sort of glistened and reflected the sunlight, which would have been amazing um, to see, certainly. Um, so there are different scholars who have different ideas about what's depicted. Um, Mary Miller and Carl Taub, if you're in Art 207, you're reading Mary Miller's book, FYI. Um, they think that these, um, what we see here depicted is a war serpent. Um, so they're saying that um, this figure is this serpent here um, that's repeated on here and that has these um, different heads and they depict a war serpent. Uh, this is somewhat supported with archaeology. Underneath the pyramid, they found burials of what appear to be warriors. They're almost all male around the age of 18. Um, it's not clear how they died. Um, they seem to be in good health, um, and they're dressed in attire that um, would suggest that they are warriors, that they're at the perfect age to go off to battle. Like Warriors would wear like belts that had like obsidian on them. Um, and so this was a warrior's costume. So we have these burials of warriors um, underneath this pyramid. So perhaps um, they were set up there to guard or protect this site. Um, so perhaps there's some reference um, to war here. Um, Michael Coe, who's Mayanist, um, says that it's this fire serpent um, based on a similar story in the Maya region. So some of these ideas are similar, that um, perhaps it depicts this origin myth, um, that there is a fire serpent um, who represents war, um, and there's the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl, who um, represents peace, and that they're sort of intertwined and fighting in this cosmic ocean. Um, and these are these deities that um, help to create um, the Earth and create time. There are also some scholars um, that think there are calendrical references, um, because um, 
They think that there are 260 of these um, feathered serpent heads um, going around this pyramid. And by the way, um, the Mesoamerican, there are two calendars. They have a solar calendar that has 360 days. And then there are these five weird days at the end where like, don't go outside. Um, <laughs> Seriously, people didn't. They like stayed inside. There were these crazy, um, auspicious days. Um, but there's also a 260-day calendar. Um, and so a lot of scholars say, well, it's not an accident um, that this serpent is depicted 260 times um, on this pyramid. So perhaps um, referencing um, this sacred um, calendar. And this calendar is the calendar that dictated rituals. Right? So there were different months when different deities were worshipped, um, where different actions had to take place um, to appease these different deities. So these are some of the ideas of what's depicted on um, this pyramid. I was trained by an Aztec art specialist at UCLA. Um, and so when we looked at these, we always compared them to images that we saw in the Aztec world. And of course, we heard um, this term Tlaloc. So Tlaloc is um, the Nahuatl name for this rain deity, um, literally meaning he who lies on the earth, sort of like a cloud against um, the mountains, a rain deity, um, a storm god, um, a pan Mesoamerican god that certainly existed before the Aztec. The Aztec are interesting because when they come to power, um, one thing that they do, they do lots of things, um, sort of right um, in terms of building an empire. Um, but one thing that they do that's really interesting is that they absorb all of these deities into their pantheon, right? So they like go conquer a place and they're like, oh yeah, you have this god, we have that god too. It's good. That's our god also. You can keep worshiping that god, you can keep speaking your language, you can keep doing whatever you want to do, just make sure that you pay your taxes every year. And People don't like paying their taxes. Um, so uh, you can, it's easy for the Aztec to recruit people to help them, um, uh, for the Spaniards to recruit people to help them overthrow the Aztec. Um, but anyway, the Aztec absorbed this deity, this rain god, that existed already all over the region before they came to power. So a pan-Mesoamerican god um, in the Maya region called Chuck. Um, and one of the two deities represented at the Aztec Temple Mayor, which is the great temple of the Aztec Empire. And we look at images of Tlaloc that, again, the Spaniards are telling us, this is Tlaloc, the rain deity. And you look at his face, and you say, oh, look, he has this like goggly eye thing. And he has this like weird, snaky mustache thing and things. And people look at this, and they go, that, that looks like what we see on the Temple of the Plumed Serpent. Here's um, Tlaloc. Um, that same image in the Codex Barbonicus here, also depicted sitting on a mountain of water shooting out of it. And in case you weren't sure that this is water, there are little shells to tell you that um, this is water. And then there's a person, I don't know, flying up a waterfall, I guess. <laughs> um, but you see that um, kind of goggle eye thing, that mustache and those um, sort of fangs. And people say, you know what, that, that's what's depicted on this pyramid. It looks like Tlaloc. So here we're looking at a Spanish, um, an image that sort of represents Tlaloc. You can see the European influence here, right, in terms of the way the image is depicted. Um, right, there's like this attempt at doing the shadow, right, and um, perspective. Although, I don't know, are we floating above this rug? I'm not sure. Um, but here you can see that same face again, right? So this looks like Tlaloc. Let's call it Tlaloc. Um, and then um, there's this other deity, the feathered serpent deity, um, that we see depicted in um, Aztec art. Um, this feathered serpent god of life, of wind, of the morning star. And he has this kind of funny mouth that if you look at the calendar and the day signs, this is the image, this is the day sign for wind. It looks like this mouth. Also a pan Mesoamerican god. Um, that existed all over the region, um, again, before the Aztec came to power. Um, the Aztec absorb it into their pantheon. We see it at um, Tula. We see it at Chichen Itza. If anybody has been to Cancun and then gone to Chichen Itza, and you go to the Temple of the Thousand Warriors, and you see those big giant rattlesnake things, right? Those are um, perhaps um, a depiction of this same 
kind of deity, um, this feathered serpent deity. Um, so we look at those and we think, okay, we think this is Tlaloc, the rain deity, and of course it fits in that there are all these seashells sort of reminding us of water, um, the, of the importance of water, and the feathered serpent deity um, on the facade of this temple, the temple of the plumed serpent. Um, perhaps these are archetypes. Again, we're calling them Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, and Tlaloc, the rain deity. But these are Nahuatl terms. These are Aztec names for these gods. And these, this was built way before the Aztecs. So it could be a misnomer. But this is what the sort of general consensus is, um, although art historians fight over it all the time. Um, this is what I think they are. But um, perhaps there will be a new discovery that teaches us something else. Um, there are always um, excavations going on um, at this site. Um, so what is the significance of this iconography? What's the iconology? What does it mean to see images of this water deity? Um, what does it mean to see images of this life-giving god all over Teotihuacan? Of course, I told you it was all about power for me. Um, of course, those people in power, the powerful elite, can appease the capricious deities. And you have to remember that these deities are sort of like the Greek gods, right? That they're always like, you know, sleeping with one of the other one's sisters and tricking the other ones into something and um, sort of creating mischief um, in each other's lives. That you can appease these deities um, through uh, ritual practices. And you have to if you want things like rainfall and sunshine to keep occurring. Um, and if you can make sure that you can keep these things happening, the food will grow. And if you got food, you can keep everybody happy. So the elite are keeping um, the world in motion through religion and through ritual. Um, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip this. But oh, by the way, they found liquid mercury underneath the pyramid. <laughs> that, we could talk about that um, at another um, at another date. But this is crazy. Um, and in the end, um, probably a combination of things uh, make Teotihuacan fall. Probably um, some definitely deforestation is occurring. Definitely. Um, and when you deforest, um, eventually you erode the soil. Um, and then you have crop failure and then famine, right? Perhaps there um, was some infighting. Um, perhaps, I don't know, an earthquake. Um, these happen all the time in this region. And you know that there are volcanoes all around. So maybe a combination of all these things happening. And eventually, um, this great city um, falls by 650. Uh, and sort of no longer exists in this magnificent state that it once was. But you can go there um, and check it out. And hopefully one day soon we will have a study abroad program and we can go there and study Mexican art and visit Teotihuacan. Um, but until then, you can take Art 207 in the fall. <laughs> and we're running out of time, so we'll stop there. Um, and let's see if anybody has questions. Oh, so many questions. Yeah, OK. Well, I saw one of those uh, pictures of the pyramid. Yeah. There was um, a piece, like a huge piece of stone, and it was like a maple head with the head of that head. I got you in on the head of that you in. It was just a, a, an arbitrary piece that made its own sound. Is that there? That was on here? Oh, like this? Yeah. yeah, so this is probably just stuck here. This looks like something that fell off of the staircase. Okay. So on the side of the staircase somewhere, um, there, there are these um, depictions of these kind of serpent heads. Oh, okay. um, but you can, t this is, it's, it's sort of, I mean, it's very damaged and it's sort of in ruin. So this is kind of, I don't know, right. various archaeological rubble. <laughs> That's a technical term for it. What's that? This is a good question, right? Mexico City, you looked at the map. It's not at the beach. So when everybody would always ask me why I was tan, wasn't tan, I wasn't at the beach. 
I was in the mountains. I was in the valley in Mexico City. So obviously they have long distance trade routes with some cultures living along the coast, right? And that they're bringing um, shells and inspired by these shells and depicting these shells in their art. So water is definitely very important. What else? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know yet. They just found it, um, but they found liquid mercury. So underneath um, the pyramid, uh, they, ha they found a, a tunnel, first of all, that they haven't totally excavated. They, like, shoved robots down there or something. Science stuff, I don't know. Um, but they looked under there, and they found this tunnel underneath. Um, and along the way, they found um, art objects like masks and other things buried under there and they're sort of digging their way in looking for something and everybody is waiting like are they gonna find the king right this is what everybody's waiting for this royal burial we can't find it anywhere it's there's no royal burial at Teotihuacan there are lots of people buried under all the pyramids but there's nobody that looks like a king um, and they expect that because if you go to the Mayan region you go to these pyramids and inside of them are the lords right the kings um, and nobody can find that at Teotihuacan. And I think there wasn't one. I think that maybe it was ruled by an, a council of elites, something like that. But we'll see. I don't know. They haven't finished, so we'll find out. Um, but they did find liquid mercury. Um, and some people think um, that this was um, painted on cinnabar onto pots um, and other ritual objects that would have been burnt. And I guess when you burn it, it turns into liquid mercury. So this might have been something that was used in rituals. Um, but we're still sort of waiting. Yeah. Um, I have two actually, actually I have two questions, two observations to make. First, um, when you showed the timeline of different civilizations, I noticed something odd. Um, I noticed that the Toltec Empire, the beginnings of the Toltec civilization, um, seemed to coincide almost exactly with Teotihuacan's end. Yes. Which makes me think, could the Toltec have possibly have some connection to Teotihuacan. They've been refugees from the city's destruction or perhaps even conquered. Yeah, yes. The answer is yes. Th both of those things are possible. Um, probable. Um, these other cities in the post-classic period rise up um, after Teotihuacan falls, after the great... Teotihuacan was so influential and so powerful, and then that power is dispersed in the post-classic period. And there are lots of small sites um, that are fighting for that power. It's a Game of Thrones, if you will. Um, I'm a nerd. Okay. Bonnie. So, people do. Um, so, first of all, um, that is probably exaggerated. The, the, certainly, human sacrifice existed. Certainly, the Aztec were practicing some human sacrifice. Um, probably not at the numbers that either the Aztec said or that the Spaniards said. So, either the Spaniards exaggerated um, in order to um, sort of dehumanize the indigenous people, because you have to do that if you're going to destroy them, right? Um, or perhaps the Aztec nobles who the Spaniards were interviewing were exaggerating to sort of um, show off, you know, how great the Aztec were. Um, but if they were really um, sacrificing that many people at that time, they would wipe out their population. Um, so you can't really trust the numbers. Um, but there is certainly some evidence of human sacrifice in the Aztec world. At Teotihuacan, um, we have, like I said, there are burials. And the warrior burials under the pyramid of the plumed serpent, um, they, it appeared that there was nothing sort of wrong with them. Um, that they were not, they didn't have any battle wounds on their bones, so they might have, like, I don't know, been buried alive or been given some substance or something that they, um, they might have been sacrificed. Um, that is correct. So it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but we have to look at the evidence. Basically, all we know is that, medically speaking, there's nothing wrong with them except for, A, the fact that they're dead. Yes. And, B, the fact that they're bones. Yes. So, I mean, they're dead, yes, for sure. Uh, <laughs> but, but, yes, so there's... 
there, there's not a great deal of evidence of human sacrifice at Teotihuacan. There's some, um, but they're all, there's like a lot of bird sacrifice. There are a lot of other animals that are sacrificed too. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, I mean, these, if this is a rain deity and um, the feathered serpent deity on um, the facade of this temple, and I think that it is, um, this is, these deities already existed before Teotihuacan. Exactly, like they have a different name um, in a different region, or there's a different story about how they came about. Um, but there are these sort of pan-Mesoamerican um, ideas that are happening at Teotihuacan, but there are also um, people who are preserving their own culture at Teotihuacan. So there's like an interesting mix. There's like sort of like state religion. Like everybody agrees that these are like the big deities, um, but somebody from Oaxaca who's living in the Zapotec um, barrio might be um, worshiping their own ancestors, their own deities with their own names. Um, so there's a really interesting mix happening at Teotihuacan. Yeah. Uh huh. That, that it's domestic architecture? Oh, OK, yeah. Well, um, probably several things. So first of all, the way that they're built and the way that they're set up, they're um, sort of multi-roomed complexes built around um, courtyards. And people would probably be spending most of their time in these sort of courtyards, spending their days there. Um, interacting with each other, making their typical art. So they found evidence of um, art making, of um, you know, agricultural items, um, sort of everyday items. Um, so, um, and the way that they're built, that they're sort of closed off, um, and that they're not these big sort of public spaces, that they appear to be private spaces. And although they're um, apartment complexes, they're also work, they're like live work lofts. Really, um, like there are, there's an obsidian workshop, um, so people are probably living there, but also working in obsidian, working in their traditional craft. Um, and these, you really have to take R two O seven because <laughs> the murals at Teotihuacan are amazing. They're beautiful, and the murals are a later development after um, this pyramid that we looked at. Um, so they're really advanced, and they're really the style of Teotihuacan is really developed in the mural art. So uh, it was hard to choose what to talk about today. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the lumber 260. Yeah. And uh, the marker might have lone star. Yeah. That's Venus. Venus, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so the, some scholars think that in the mouth of, of um, this feathered serpent that there would be something placed in the mouth and that you would move it every day and that you would count the time with this, and that it would relate to this 260-day calendar. Yeah. There are people called archaeoastronomers. I am not one of them. Um, but they study, they're archaeologists who study astronomy also. Um, and they, they can figure out all of these things with um, the way the buildings are lined up with the stars and whatnot. Yeah. It takes, it takes a village. Archaeologists, anthropologists, art historians, astronomers, everybody trying to figure out um, what's going on here. OK. I think it's, we're running out of time, so let's wrap it up. If you want to ask me any more questions, you can come up and talk to me. Um, thanks. <laughs>